There was no evidence that Governor, that, that uh, Mr. Noriega was involved in drugs, no hard evidence, until we indicted him. Does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. It does not. Not wittingly. Have we ever tried to meddle in other countries' elections? Oh, probably, but uh, it was for the good of the system. Oh, well, we don't mess around other people's well, elections, yeah. Welcome to another episode of the Rackets Podcast. This episode is going to be a continuation from the prior one that focused primarily on the fact that Myanmar has become really the epicenter of illegal drug production throughout the world. And the timing lines up with the coup that was launched by the military there back in 2021. In other words, there's been a crime explosion in that country. There's a lot of corruption tied to it. And, and there's a lot of crimes that the, the government profits from other than drugs. I'm going to touch upon there's a massive upswing in human trafficking, scams. The regime is guilty of a massive human rights uh, violations and war crimes, a potential genocide, ethnic cleansing. And so, yeah, that we're going to cover a whole lot in this episode. So what I want to do is focus first upon one of their cronies. So this man here, he was he was arrested back in Thailand in 2022 in Bangkok. So he, and there are other cronies attached to the junta, but I really like to point at him and hit in this specific example, because I think it paints a better picture. So yes, he was again arrested back in 2022 for drug and money laundering charges in Thailand. So they did a massive raid of one of his properties, found, you know, millions of dollars. But what they also found was that he had the, some of the banking records and a property deed for some of the children of the junta leader. It's well known that he, he is uh, attached to the regime there. He's one of their top procurers for weapons for the regime. But also the fact that the junta... They, they have lots of wealth outside of the country, so you can try to sanction them. But again, it's just tough because they have so many assets and resources outside of their border, right? One of the, one of the really interesting pieces of news is that apparently the, the, the junta leader did reach out to the Thai authorities to try to get his children's name removed from that criminal case. And... Thailand is also run by a military junta as well. It's been that way for a very long time. There's a lot of crime and corruption in that country as well, but nowhere near the human rights atrocities that w- what we see in Myanmar. Again, there's 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 definitely crime there, but it's we're talking about two very different countries. But it, it does look as though that those that there was essentially like a backdoor deal that was made because again the charges were dropped against this this top level crony for the country earlier this year he was tied to another Thai official there one of the reasons i wanted to point to him is because he has many different businesses but gambling is illegal in myanmar although there are several casinos throughout the country and they're usually populated right along the thailand and the chinese border in china gambling is also illegal there other than in macau um but A lot of the the Chinese citizens who do want to gamble, they'll just go right across the border to some of these different gambling towns. So to operate these these different casinos, you know, typically you're going to have to have a license. There are plenty of unlicensed gambling locations in Myanmar. But again, the junta allows it as long as as long as they're getting their cut, they get a percentage of the revenue. So I'm just trying to, to focus on with this whole topic of all of these different crimes and, and all the corruption that is helping to enable the, the, the atrocities that have been happening in Myanmar over the last couple of years and, and for decades that, that are really helping to, to prop up this regime. This man here, again, he, he has been sanctioned by the U.S. Treasury. Um, he procures most of his weapons through China, but he also gets weapons and, and, and has made deals with Israel in order to help, again, arm and, and enable the Myanmar military. The reason why I wanted to point to that, because there is one particular Israeli company called Cognite Software. So 
they are traded on the NASDAQ. And the reason I like to bring that up is, again, because the United States claims that that they really care about human rights and that they want to put pressure on these different countries, you know, et cetera. Well, Israel is obviously a major ally to the United States. And I haven't seen much accountability as far as that, as far as this particular issue. Israel banned the sale of weapons to Myanmar because at the time um, there was just a massive upswing and violence against the Rohingya. So they are an ethnic minority in, in Myanmar. I'm going to go into more details there in a second about that. Their country banned the sale of weapons to Myanmar because of the, the horrible human rights record. Again, that was before the coup actually took place in 2021. So there's an advocacy group called Justice for Myanmar, and they filed a lawsuit. I believe it was with the Israeli attorney general. But nonetheless, they filed a lawsuit um, against this company for selling this technology. They sold spyware to the regime. Horrible war crimes have been committed by this group. It's, it's the type of country that needs to be cut off from this type of technology and it, it never should should have been sold to them but there's really been no accountability i think i've seen a public statement by the attorney general there in israel but there's there's just been nothing there's been there's been no accountability for this company and again this is a company that is traded on the nasdaq so there is some connectivity there with the united states government so I just mentioned about the Rohingya. Let's give a little bit of context. Many people would describe them as a stateless people. The Rohingya are a Muslim minority in the southern portion of Myanmar, primarily in the Rakhine state. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. They were stripped of their citizenship by the government back in 1982. Um, they've been the victim of persecution long before that um, for many decades. And there, there's just really vile hate speech that's just openly issued towards these people. One of the things that really bothers me is that the Nobel Prize winner, who's the head of the, the National League for Democracy, it's one of the groups that really was starting to, to gain power in the country to, to offset some of the power of the regime. She, she was issued a Nobel Prize back in... I forget how long, I think 2015, but she refuses to even use the word Rohingya. The reason why I bring that up is because they're, in a denigrating way, they're referred to as Bengalis, as though they're Bangladesh. They want to refuse the fact that these people are um, from Myanmar and they, and they they should have their citizenship. So they essentially have no rights. There's been all kinds of per persecution against this group for a long time. What I did want to highlight here is back in May of 2017, the UN did an estimate that said over 168,000 Rohingya were displaced um, throughout Myanmar and across the border there over the last five years. So just to kind of give you a scale of what's happening, I mean, that's, that's a gigantic humanitarian crisis. The reason why I wanted to point to that particular report is because there was a massive upswing just months later. So there was a small militant group, the ARSA, and they committed attacks against police and military forces, killed about 20 people. The reaction by the government is it's just so disturbing. Close to a million people were displaced. And it's tough to give the appropriate term. I'm not a human rights attorney, so I don't know how to exactly to label this stuff. It is complex. Um, the United States government did label it a genocide, uh, human rights, uh, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, I think they labeled it a human catastrophe. I think we could all call it ethnic cleansing as a fair, a fair description of what happened. But long story short, their military started burning down villages, committing mass rape of the, of the women, um, killing women, children, innocent civilians. In mass, um, I've seen reports, you know, from from UN investigators, where they said that roughly 50% of the women had either been a victim of rape or witnessed rape. I mean, it's it's just an absolute atrocity what took place. And, and like I said, and literally over about a year's period, about a, 
close to a million, just under a million people were displaced from the area. What's even more disturbing is that these people really are refugees. And in many cases, some of the neighboring countries refuse to allow them entry. Almost the vast majority of these refugees have gone to Bangladesh. I've seen estimates that over 10,000 people were killed. So the, the military or the government literally called these clearance operations, removing an entire race of people out of the country. It's despicable. There's a reason that you need to know about this, and, and it does tie to the current times, right? Um, when you look into this story, there's so many angles um, to discuss. But even when these people go to the refugee camps, there's just all kinds of reports of, again, people, murders, rape, all types of just terrible human rights abuses, even once they're supposed to get to safety. You have to keep that in the back of your mind that there's just this horrible human rights catastrophe that was taking place in this region of the country. So how do the neighboring countries react? China swoops in and, and basically makes the decision that, hey, let's, let's go advance our geopolitical agenda. This can be good for China, what's taking place, this ethnic cleansing that's happening here in Myanmar. The regime, again, they killed so many people, their forces committed so many of these different crimes. And literally what they did was they just started basically eliminating the memory of these people and their towns, removing the names of the towns. Hundreds of towns were destroyed and villages burned down by their military. And as this is happening, just a few months after the, the upswing starts in August of, of 2017, in November of 2017, the government of China proposed an economic treaty with Myanmar and has to do with infrastructure in the exact same areas or in the exact same state where a lot of these crimes are being committed. So they proposed that a month later, the UN had a vote to go in and to try to investigate the, the crimes that were committed by the Myanmar government. Well, guess what? China voted against it. Russia voted against it. Russia isn't, you know, getting any infrastructure deals out of it. But as I discussed on the last episode, Russia has, has made a lot of money from selling weapons to the, the, the Myanmar government. So I think I mentioned it before. So yes, the U.S. State Department, they did label this as a genocide in 2022. But China has has improved or has bettered them, themselves from this horrible catastrophe. There was a port deal signed there in the Rock End State. So they're able to, to drill for oil. They're able to, to not only drill for the oil, but to transport it. So they built pipelines throughout Myanmar that do connect through China. So the state, the Chinese state oil company is the one that's profiting from it. Um, and when I mentioned the geopolitics, it's not so much just about the money and the access to the oil. As you can see here on this, um, on this map hit there below, this issue of access to oil has been a long time concern for China. If you see the red portion there on the bottom, that's what's known as the Strait of Malacca. Roughly 80% of China's oil comes through that really narrow waterway. And there is a lot of piracy that occurs there. So just as a matter of their national security interest, this is obviously something that they wanted to, to address. You need to be able to have access to resources, but to do this right on the back end of what, not, not, not I'm sorry, not the back end, while this major catastrophe is taking place, to take advantage of that. Again, this it's just despicable. So it's not just China that has taken advantage of this horrible catastrophe um, with the Rohingyas. So India also jumped into it with the major infrastructure plan as well. When that um, is when the crisis really jumped into an upswing, and that's when uh, a year later India goes in and signs another agreement um, with Myanmar. The plans that origi originated back in 2008, you know, for this infrastructure deal uh, to build a port, to build a roadway um, to connect into the mainland there with India, but it stalled for a long time. 
And again, just the timing of it to me, it's it's just absurd to see what's happening there and then say, okay, we, we need we need to form a a formal infrastructure deal with this with this rogue government. It's it's disgusting. So some context there. India has one other port city outside of its country that's in, in Iran, if I remember right. But put aside all the catastrophes that let's just focus on the geopolitics for a second. It's very valuable to India of having this port. So they have a, an Indian state-owned company that runs the port. They can get access to Southeast Asia. And they're also building that roadway there that you can see on the map as well. A big part of why this is strategically important to them is if you look at this narrow piece of land here between their neighboring countries known as the Siliguri Corridor, just like how China has some vulnerabilities with accessing resources, you can see how a neighboring country can try to cut off resources to them. So this was, again, a very strategic value to their country. But again, under the circumstances and the way that this was created, it's just, again, it's despicable because what's happened is the Myanmar government has gone through, they've murdered several people, raped several people. They've stolen their land from all of these different people in the process. It's it's horrible. One thing that you should know about as well with this project is there has been interference. So there's the Iraqi army. Their stronghold is in, in the Rakhim state as well. They are an ethnically Buddhist group. They are adamant enemies against the Rohingya people as well. As I mentioned in the last episode, they're one of the strongest members of that alliance that's currently fighting the, the Myanmar junta, get money from drugs as well. And their group has been adamantly opposed to this infrastructure deal for their own self-interest, for just being able to control the area. They don't like seeing a foreign country come in and gather up resources and gaining from that. Uh, this is something that India has done in order to also gain their 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 level of influence and power in the region as well. That port and that roadway gives them a big leg up, and it's a counter. There, it's a counterbalance to China's growing power as well. So I brought up the, the Rohingya crisis of the past, and it's not a, it's not as though that this problem has gone away. The violence, you know, for quite a few years there absolutely decreased for quite a bit, but it's not as though these people ever got their rights. They've been living in refugee camps for this whole time. Most of them have not returned to Myanmar. Um, and the thing is what we've seen in this year, we've seen a real uptick in violence. So there's a report by Human Rights Watch um, that over a thousand Rohingya were forced into military service by the regime because just like i mentioned the iraqi army that's that's their rival well guess what there, there's fighting that's taking place in that region the military they've wiped them out and it's it's just despicable that they've they've not only wiped off so many of the rohingya people and killed so many people and just done so much horrible stuff to then conscript them to force them into military service for the same government I mean, it just blows your mind, the level of evil, when you really think about that. There, I've also seen reports that the Iraqi army has also conscripted some of these Rohingya people. And the group that I mentioned there before, the ARSA, the one that's been labeled a terrorist group by the government, they're now allying with the government. This is something that you will see with Myanmar history, because there, there's so many of these different ethnic groups, and you will see that allies become enemies and vice versa. You, you see that kind of stuff. Um, but again, I just, it, it's just so disturbing. Um, so, long story short, there's one report of over 100 people killed in one of the townships, and I've seen reports where over 70,000 people have been displaced just over a two month period. So, with the civil war that's going on, it seems that that, that upsurge in violence um, and, and just the victimization of what the Rohingya people have to deal with, it's it's just awful, right? And I keep pointing to the, the Iraqi army. 
Um, and in many ways, again, it's it, it just comes down to uh, just ethnic hatred for another, eth- one ethnic group's hatred for another ethnic group. There's something else that we need to be aware of as well is that, again, this Iraq, Iraqi army, they've received support from the Chinese government for, for several years. I sort of view it as essentially sort of a proxy force, you could kind of call it that way. You've seen the United States government do this. Again, I hate that as well. Very anti-war. And and you see what China's doing, you know, sort of a mirror image. Um, but yeah, what, what we're seeing is it's not just this group that's trying to fight against the, the military regime of Myanmar. That same rebel group is guilty for all types of sec- sectarian violence. Um, it's always been in the back of my mind. I do wonder, is part of the motivation for China, because that's, that same group was also committing acts of sabotage against the infrastructure deal uh, for India, is, is that part of China's motivation as well, that the same group is also going to, is, is attempting to hurt their geopolitical rival. There's just so there's so much just terrible stuff that's going on in this region of the world. So I brought all of that up to go into a topic that is arguably even more disturbing. So you may have read the reports about these different cyber scams that are occurring in Southeast Asia. Myanmar really is one of the main areas there. If we look at this map, this is from another UN report, and we look at massive epidemic of human trafficking and scam centers. I'm going to go a little more into the details in a second here. But if we look at the map, so much of it is occurring right along the border here in Myanmar. And it ties in with, that's where the organized groups are. And and in many cases, these groups are aligned with the, the junta, with the government there. In Myanmar. So let's get an idea of the scale of what's happening because I just don't think that the average person can imagine what's what's happening there. So the UN estimated recently that there are 120,000 victims of human trafficking in Myanmar tied to these these scam compounds and there's another 100,000 victims in Cambodia. So Let's let's get a, a big picture of, of what I'm talking about. The neighboring countries are, these are very low income areas. So typically people who are really poor are going to be more prone to some of these different types of human trafficking traps. So they'll have ads online that you're luring somebody in thinking that they're getting a real job that has these great benefits and great pay, et cetera. And that's not what's happening. Organized crime groups are forcing these people to go to work for them. And they're not getting paid. They're they're literally victims of human trafficking. And here's the second part of it. They're not going and, say, working in a factory or, or doing something along those lines. They're literally sitting in these compounds where they're on the phone, where they're on the Internet, where what, if you're, say, a, a person from Thailand who is lured in there, you're going and picking up the phone and you're calling other people in Thailand and sending text messages and emails to the people with your same dialect, your same voice, et cetera. And you're pulling all of these different scams. There's these romance scams. There's scams where trying to lure people into what they think is some great investment. It's really just a Ponzi scheme, the asset recovery, that's sort of like those Nigerian prince type email scams. You name it, deep fakes, every type of scam imaginable. And the victims are usually the people from their same country. So it's just double victimization. This is this is horrible stuff. So just in the last year, and a UN estimate was that there was anywhere from 18 billion to 37 billion dollars lost from the people who were the victims of the scam. Again, that's not not even factoring in the human suffering for the people who have to commit these offenses. So they've not only been lured into a human trafficking scam, they have to go and and commit these horrible, horrible crimes against the people of their own country. So the primary location for these human trafficking victims is China. There's several countries, 
even um, I believe a few U.S. victims involved in this, but most of it, most of the victims are from Southeast Asia. I showed you the map there earlier. In almost really every instance, these are not the money behind it. It's not going to the armed ethnic group, rebel groups. That's unlike the drug war of how I was um, explaining in the prior episode. The drugs, all the, the drug money, also benefits the rebel groups as well. Whereas with this issue of these of these human trafficking scam centers, and really in almost every instance, I don't know of any instance in which it's not a group that is not tied to the regime. Again, the regime is making money off of this. You're seeing estimates of several billion dollars that they're making from this horrible crime. And I'm not saying that this, this didn't exist before the Civil War, but what we're seeing is, again, a massive upsurge. This is helping to prop up this regime. Um, I'm going to point to this specific, the, the cocaine, uh, BGF. Um, so when I say BGF, that's Border Guard Force. If you didn't listen to the prior episode, I beg you, hey, go back and listen. I'll give you more context to what we're talking about here. But Border Guard Forces are essentially armed rebel groups in Myanmar that the government made a deal with. And the unwritten rule is that you're so powerful that we don't want to fight with you anymore. What we'll do is we're going to essentially give you autonomy in your region. You want to have drugs and unregulated casinos, et cetera. You get to do whatever you want to do as far as organized crime. We'll get away with it, but you cannot fight us anymore. You have to be on the government's side, right? So this particular border guard, um, border guard force group is very much tied to the junta and they're rebels with one of the leading i'm sorry they're rivals with one of the the leading rebel groups in the current civil war so they've been making a lot of money from these scam centers and china for the last few years has put pressure on their government but it, it's just built up to a to a level to where china really is starting to use force and, and and to really combat this, there's just so many just terrible examples that would just break your heart if you really looked into it. I'm pointing to one specific one back in October of last year. This group, they had a one of these scam centers and they killed over 50 Chinese nationals. And it seemed to have really captured the attention of the Chinese government because reportedly, I, I don't know that for a fact, but Four of those people were actually undercover Chinese police. They were going in there and they were investigating this. And again, this group, they killed, they just massacred a large number of the people. And again, that's part of how they make these human trafficking scams work is obviously people don't want to do that, but they use whatever means necessary. They'll kill people as an example. They'll torture people as an example. They'll threaten to harm your family back home, whatever terrible means that you can come up with. That's that's what they're doing. Um, and apparently in this one particular compound, they literally had lions and tigers and bears. They kept that. They kept those animals on the premises essentially as the threat to know that if you didn't go forward with, with pulling these scams and getting the money for them, that that's, that's the fate that you would meet. Um, it's, it's, it's really horrible stuff. And again, it does tie into that these these used to be just casino towns. So that particular town, you know, it's it's nicknamed Little Macau. There's, I believe, over 30 casinos in this. It's a very small township. But again, that's what the government does um, of Myanmar. So I am, if you take the issue here in the United States, I am an advocate for a legal, transparent, well-regulated gambling industry. But in, in, an, in an area of the world like Myanmar that is essentially lawless, casinos are really just money laundering vehicles um, for, for these regimes and for these rebel forces. So the good news is, is that the issue, this issue has become so bad that it did force Myanmar to actually take some action because of the Chinese, because of the pressure from the Chinese government. So three of their four leaders, 
They were arrested and extradited. You can see the picture of one of them there. Another one of them, I should have put the quote marks on there, was allegedly killed himself while in custody. Supposedly, he wrestled away a pistol from one of the arresting officers and killed himself. I don't believe that. I don't believe it at all. But there have been. There have been a lot of arrests just in the, the month of January. 41,000 suspects were extradited to China. So China is sweeping in and really trying to take um, strong action against what's happening there. I don't know how much progress that they're going to make. I mean, at least we're starting, there's been a lot of media awareness about this. So we're starting to see that this isn't just something that's happening in the shadows. I'm glad that, you know, more people know about it. And it does seem that I think that this would just continue if China didn't put their foot down. The Myanmar regime will apparently do anything. There, there is no humanity with this group. They will do whatever they want in order to stay in power. I mean, you, you think about it, ethnic cleansing, human trafficking, you name it. There seems to be no problem with it as long as it props them up. Um, so there is more to talk about with Myanmar and, and these scam centers. So that will be, I'm going to go into more detail on the next episode. But as you notice on the map, it's again, it's not just an issue in Myanmar. And I do want to talk more about China's role in this crime and, and other crimes as well on the next episode. So, yes, please, um, please support this podcast in any way that you can and stay tuned. It's a big club and you ain't in it. I am concerned that the size of some of these institutions becomes so large that it does become difficult for us to um, to prosecute. You can have a license. The price is $250,000 plus a monthly payment of 5% of the gross of all four hotels in the store. Corleone. <laughs>